On behalf of the Commission, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. My name is Penny Armitage and for the last two years I have been honoured to chair the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. Joining me today are my fellow Commissioners, Professor Bernadette McSherry, Professor Alan Fells and Dr Alex Cochram. The Royal Commission has delivered its final report to the Governor. The report will be tabled by the Victorian Government in Parliament and publicly released. In this presentation, I will briefly describe the Commission's work, outline the major themes of our inquiry, and briefly explain the reformed mental health and wellbeing system we have redesigned. On the screen, you will see a selection of images, figures, and powerful quotes to give you a flavour of what is in the report, what the Commission has heard, and the depth of its analysis. A recording of this presentation will be made available on the Commission's website. The Commission and our inquiry. Across its five volumes and nearly 3,000 pages, the Commission's final report provides 65 recommendations that set out the reforms needed to transform Victoria's mental health system. These build on the nine recommendations the Commission made in its interim report in November 2019 to respond to immediate needs and lay the foundations for change. The report is the culmination of an exhaustive process over two full years. Over this time, the Commission received and read more than 12,500 contributions made through consultations, roundtables, public hearings, witness statements, surveys and workshops. We received more than 3,200 formal submissions from individuals and organisations. The Commission has welcomed the extraordinary level of engagement right across the community since the very early days of the inquiry and right up until the final workshops and activities that were held online due to COVID restrictions. Comparatively, the engagement with this Commission is truly staggering and speaks to the importance of the topic for our community. We see this engagement as a hallmark of this Royal Commission and the community's commitment to its aspirations. In addition to this consultation, we undertook a thorough investigation and analysis. The Commission used more than 7,500 research articles and reports to understand current issues and reform opportunities. This review of the literature was accompanied by unprecedented access to data obtained via the voluntary cooperation of government and services and the use of the Commission's powers. You'll see this data throughout our report and in some of the slides today. I have every confidence in saying this volume of material about the mental health system has never been considered in the past. Formal deliberations of the Commissioners alone involved the considerations of more than 12,000 pages of analysis. I hope with the full implementation of the reforms we've recommended, an, acquire, an inquiry of this nature will never need to be repeated. The establishment of the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system in February 2019 acknowledged that Victoria's mental health system was failing to support those who needed it. The Premier of Victoria, the Honourable Daniel Andrews, described the system then as broken. The letters patent that officially established the Commission required it to report on how Victoria's mental health system could most effectively prevent mental illness and deliver treatment, care and support so that all those in the Victorian community could experience their best mental health now and into the future. The scope and, and approach of our inquiry was clearly laid out in those letters patent, presenting a call for an inquiry that would be forward-looking and systems-driven. Despite the numerous reviews that have preceded this inquiry, Royal Commissions represent a unique opportunity to review systems because of their independence, neutrality and transparency. They hold great public value. With the support of the community, this Royal Commission has left a lasting legacy to realise the hopes and ambitions held by many. Victoria's mental health system is depleted and broken, 
but it did not simply deteriorate overnight. Good mental health and wellbeing has been a low priority of governments over decades, despite the high prevalence of mental illness and poor mental health in our community. For too long, the profound human, societal and economic toll of a broken mental health system has been ignored. Victoria's mental health system, once admired as the most progressive in our nation, has catastrophically failed to live up to expectations. Despite the goodwill, passion and hard work of many people, the, sy the system does not meet the current needs of the community and is woefully unprepared for the future. As Honor Eastley told the Commission, a broken and traumatic system can see people who are seeking help blaming themselves for the system's failures. The system is hampered by historical and structural challenges that have emerged and persisted over several decades. Underinvestment, poor system planning and limited accountability have ensured good mental health and wellbeing remain a low priority across government and the community. Stigma and discrimination has entrenched this. This has resulted in a mental health system that fails to support and in some instances even harms those who turn to it. Da demand has outstripped supply, the system reacts to mental health crises rather than preventing them, and the preferences of people living with mental illness and all psychological distress are often ignored. The quote on the screen now was shared with us anonymously. It reflected what so many have said to us about their experiences, of working up the courage to ask for help, only to be turned away. This is a result of a deeply compromised system. Personally, I was shocked by what I saw and what I heard in the course of this commission. I have worked in senior roles in government departments for decades, and I was confronted by the fact that the system wasn't compromised in part, its foundations were broken. The historical neglect of mental health means that Band-Aid solutions will not work. The words of a participant in our community consultation speaks to what is needed. They said, we don't want to fill in the potholes, we want a new road. The Commission recognised that the scale of change needed is profound. The system must be redesigned from its foundations. This meant that we had to adopt a systems design approach to reform. That, in, that involved recognising the set foundations and organising structures of the system. Incrementalism was not viable or a practical option. The future system will not be a collection of discrete reforms tacked onto an antiquated system, but a fundamental redesign. We wanted to ensure that we recommend, uh, what we recommended would endure, that it would not succumb to the same gradual decline experienced since the early 1990s. Earlier, I spoke about the generosity of many people that have shared their personal experiences with the Commission. We would like to recognise those organisations that have helped us with this task and would like to thank Vimiac, Tandem and Vacho in particular. We were, are also very fortunate to have two individuals who have contributed to the Commission join us as part of today's event. I had the pleasure of meeting with both of these individuals as part of our one-on-one -on -one meetings, which took place via Zoom due to the COVID-related interruptions to our second round of public hearings. First, I would like to welcome Justin Hazelwood to the stage. Justin shared his experience as a young carer as part of his witness statement in 2020. And today he will share a reading from his book, Get Up Mum, which was written from Justin's perspective as a 12 year old. Justin. Thanks, Fanny. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read from my book, Get Up Mum. I sort of did my own informal witness statement. I wrote my own book about my childhood. And so I'm going to pick up from the action here. I just got back from a summer camp, and um, I really wish things like Satellite Foundation, who have camps for children of parents with a mental illness, existed for me. I would have loved to have gone to a satellite camp. It feels so quiet now, after camp. I don't really feel like doing anything, but I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to worry again. Mum needs to go shopping, and I'm sure the floor needs a vacuum. 
The afternoon is on pause and it's heavy in my stomach. I can't start anything knowing Mum's just lying there. I clomp back to her bedroom. Mum, it's been more than five minutes. All right, dear. I really will get up, I promise. Why does Mum say she'll get up when she doesn't mean it? Does she care that it's annoying for me? I'm wasting my time when she should be spending it with me. I'm getting pissed off now. I grab the whole door and I swing it as hard as I can. It doesn't even slam properly. It just shuts with a soft bang. There's too much carpet underneath. I stand and listen to see if Mum says anything. Does she even care? I poke around the laundry. My cricket bat and ball are there, but they're useless on their own. A line of ants have gone in the laundry sink. They form perfect circles around the three soggy cat biscuits. A beach towel hangs on a nail. It's nice outside now. Why aren't we at the beach? There's waves going to waste. I shove the whole door and squeeze the frames of Mum's doorway. There's a lump in my throat. There's a lump on the bed. Get up, Mum! Okay, dear, in a minute. She's lying on her side with her eyes open. What Mum is doing is worse than sleeping in. It's worse than being lazy. It's nothing. Mum is doing nothing, and she doesn't even seem that happy about it. She's just an empty space in a lifeless room on a nothing day. The fire inside me spreads. I'm sick of this game. I'm angry. I'm, I'm not going away. I raise my voice. Get up. Now! I rip the rage from my gut. Ripples burn my throat. My voice echoes. Mum sits up slowly. I don't know whether to say sorry or yell. Again, her eyes are bleary and pleading. Her voice is quiet. Don't shout, please, dear. Afterwards, I set up a game of Monopoly. Mum is thimble. I'm racing car. If only it were real money, Mum. It's something she normally says. She stares blankly at the dice. Yes. She plays along, but I can tell she's not concentrating. She starts mashing her mouth, and her eyes gather shadows. I roll seven and land on community chest. Second prize in a beauty contest. Did you ever want to be a model, Mum? No, I was too shy. Her eyes twinkle as she sniffs at tears. Sorry, something's made me upset. I'll finish playing later. She makes a little moan as she wanders off. I sit at the table, flipping through the cards. I take the front door key off the hook and head outside. I walk to May Street's shop and buy a golden gay time. I eat it on the park bench next to the phone box. When I'm finished, I walk back home as slowly as I can. Just take the long way around. And it's quiet when I return. Justin, can you bring me some Panamax? Mum sniffs from her bedroom. I go to the cupboard and I get a glass of water. I trudge into her room as she sits up. She takes the Panamax from my hand. The tips of her fingers are warm against my palm. Thank you, dear. Have you had your other tablets? Yes, I took them before. I think back. Did I see her take them? Mum gulps the water with a squelch in her neck. Could you bring me some toilet paper, please? I go to the bathroom and tear off a few sheets. I hand Mum the paper. She does a big blow. Oh. She gives a murmur and a sniff. I'll be right now. What's upsetting you? A thought from my past. What? Oh, just people, Justin. Bad people who tried to hurt me. I sit, staring at the carpet, waiting. Can you stroke the top of my head? Mum lays her head on the pillow. 
Heat shines on her cheeks. I run my fingers over her scalp. The hair feels thin. The skin is hot. Mum has hell in her head. Thank you very much for that, Justin. Now I would like to welcome Denna Healy, who also shared her experiences with the Commission as part of her 2020 witness statement. Today, Denna will perform a poem which formed part of her submission. Feels um, very surreal to be up here, actually. Um, my poem will be addressed to my 16-year-old self, and if anyone had told me that I would be speaking at the town hall in 2021, sharing a part of my story and my family's story, I would have not believed them one bit. Um, huge thank you to Penny for doing the video interview with me. I feel like that helped me express a lot of what I've really wanted to say on behalf of myself and my family for many years, and I just never really had the right person to have the conversation with. And thank you to all the other commissioners in this room and everyone who would have attended today but couldn't be here due to COVID. Um, I appreciate all of you immensely. And hopefully from here on out, there will be some changes in the mental health system for everyone, especially those who don't have the voice to say what they need to say. I'm hoping I can speak on behalf of some of them today. Dear 16-year-old self, I see you. Your mind ruminating about what you could have done differently, how you could have shown up, who you would rather be. You're in a constant state of disconnect with every day flowing into the next. Anxiety engraved within your being like it's your middle name mind racing, heart thumping, breaking and growing with every beat. I hear you. You cry yourself to sleep most nights, exhausted after long days of wearing a facade and keeping your truth held close to your chest. It feels hard to trust, to open up, to love, to risk being hurt yet again. Vulnerability is a strength disguised as a weakness within society, opening the door to connection when fully embraced. I forgive you for starving yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. You weren't as present as you could have been in life because you didn't believe that you had a place in the world. Your eyes were closed off from the beauty that has always lived within you. I respect myself. Here I am today at 23 years old. I see how much growth I've endured and how deeply I've persevered the last few years. I have chosen myself time and time again, cultivating space within my heart and mind to love, cherish and nourish my being. I embrace myself. Painting, taking photos of nature, performing spoken word poetry, journaling about my personal experiences, adorning my body in floral dresses, adventuring in new places, daydreaming, facilitating, some of my favorite things in this world. All activities that contribute to who I am today and all of what I embody. Sensitive, gentle nature, loving heart, empathetic, open-minded, giving, grounded. I choose how I show up in every moment of my life. I choose to be Denna. I choose to be human. I honor myself. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I speak about everything and act authentically and share of myself vulnerably with all I encounter. My experiences may challenge my belief system, 
knock the absolute breath out of me for a moment or two. But they never define me. I have the power to choose how I view my life, how I view myself within this world, what my story is in my own mind, and how I show up each and every moment of every day. I'm choosing life and my story is only just beginning. So thank you, 16-year-old self, for being who you were. I value every inch of you. But now it's time to begin rewriting our own story to one where we take back the pen. Human connection conquers all. Love, 23-year-old Denner. Thank you very much to Justin and Denna. I think um, that underscores the privilege the four commissioners have had in sharing the human experience with so many over the course of the last two years and I think underscores the commitment we've had to try and make sure that we make the best possible mental health system available into the future. Thank you for sharing your reflections with us today and for all who will view this presentation. Now back to our report, the themes. Before I talk about the Commission's vision for the future, let me say something about the current challenges we heard consistently throughout our inquiry. These themes have shaped our reform directions. Undoubtedly, the biggest theme is that the system is under-resourced. There has simply never been enough investment in it. This failure to invest means that too many people struggle to get enough help or any help at all. A growing population and increasing need for mental health services means that the system is overwhelmed by demand. There are simply not enough services. As the graph on the screen shows, the Commission estimated that in 2019-20, there are up to 95,400 people who needed specialist mental health services who were unable to access them from either the public or the private sectors. The next graph shows that the estimated need for 4.7 million hours of community-based specialist mental health services from our public mental health services system. Only 1.4 million hours were provided by the public system. That means that the system is only responding to less than a third of current need. When people do get a service, data report, reported indicates that in 2019-20, active adult clients of public mental health services received about 5% of their community contact hours from a consultant psychiatrist. Surprisingly, for those who were seen by a consultant psychiatrist, the average total service hours was 2.1 hours per client per year. With so little contact, this is incredibly compromising for both clinicians and consumers. A lack of resources has forced mental health services to raise the thresholds for who they can see. This means that many people who are asked for help are turned away unless they are in absolute crisis. We heard from people and their families at times in harrowing detail about the impact of being turned away from services at their darkest hours and sometimes the tragic consequences of this. This is shameful in a developed and wealthy country like Australia where the failure to invest in mental health cannot be simply explained by a lack of resources. Victoria's mental health system is overly complex, fragmented and inconsistent across different parts of the state. People cannot easily identify paths to the right care and to recovery. There are few resources, not even a comprehensive website, to help people find and access the right supports. The next graph on the screen shows how from July last year, corresponding with and following COVID restrictions, there was a major increase of the number of young people aged up to 17 years seeking help from emergency departments in connection with intentional self-harm and suicidal thoughts. These presentations peaked in late November 2020 with a four-week moving average of just under 140 young people under the age of 17 presenting each week. 
You can see just how striking the peak is after our stage four restrictions. We all know that our preference for our young loved ones would not be an emergency department, but a pathway into more appropriate supports. Mental health services are often, too, often poorly integrated with each other and badly coordinated with areas such as housing, physical health, alcohol and other drugs, and the justice system. Commonwealth and state funded services are poorly connected despite opportunities to strengthen and encourage partnerships and coordination. The mental health system is also imbalanced. It is overly reliant on a medical approach, including hospital inpatient services and emergency departments for people in crisis. There is a striking lack of community-based services that are close to people's homes, their families and their support networks. Victoria has not achieved the long-held vision of a community-based mental health system. As a result, we are missing out on opportunities to offer community-based care to people earlier in their experiences of mental illness or psychological distress. Resource-constrained specialist mental health services rely too heavily on medication and offer too little in the way of therapeutic, recovery-oriented care. There has also been too little effort to create effective responses to mental illness and psychological distress outside the formal mental health system. We know that social factors, including the communities and places where people live, have a strong role in shaping mental health. But leaders across many sectors need to better help these places and settings to support good mental health and wellbeing. The early years of life are critical to later mental health. However, the system does not respond well to the mental health and wellbeing needs of infant and children and expectant or new parents. By failing to focus on these early years, we are missing opportunities to safeguard the mental health and wellbeing for our future generations. We also know that teenagers and young adults are disproportionately affected by mental illness and psychological distress. Our young people need world-class and holistic mental health care to support them to recover and lead flourishing lives, but too many never receive this care. This undermines their ability to achieve good mental health and well-being in adulthood. At the other end of the age spectrum, there is a big service gap for older Victorians. Increasing demand and inadequate investment in services for older adults means that many who do seek help are turned away. We do not place enough value on the mental health and well-being of our elders. We found also that access to mental health services is inequitable. Mental illness and psychological distress do not discriminate. However, some people in our community experience more barriers to getting help. Poverty and disadvantage make it especially difficult for people to access services. A disproportionate number of people living with mental illness have low incomes and no private health insurance. For many, even access to primary care is difficult to afford. Catchments that determine access to services create a postcode lottery, and where people live dictates how difficult it is to gain access to services. This situation can be worse for people in rural and regional areas. Disgracefully, sometimes it is those most in need of support who experience the most significant barriers. These groups include Aboriginal people who continue to endure the effects of trauma caused by colonisation, dispossession, the impacts of the stolen generation and ongoing discrimination. Other groups that face specific unacceptable barriers to appropriate mental health care include our LGBTIQ plus people, refugees, people from culturally diverse backgrounds and people living with disabilities. Too often, people's rights, safety and dignity have been seriously breached in mental health services. Many people who do obtain access to the system, or are forced to, have not been treated with dignity and respect. There is an excessive use of restrictive practices and compulsory treatment, and as the graph illustrates, the number of people subject to compulsory treatment is stubbornly high in Victoria. It's also stubbornly high in comparison to national rates. 
Despite the current policy commitment to use it as a last resort, there remains a persistent use of compulsory treatment for all age groups, and surprisingly, this includes young people. These interventions can cause severe trauma to people, some of whom are already traumatised by their experience of mental illness and difficult events in their lives. Our inpatient units in particular can be frightening and be unsafe. The health, mental health system should be set up to support people, not to compound their distress and trauma. The Commission found that families, carers and supporters are marginalised in many mental health services. Each year, around 60,000 Victorias care for someone living with mental illness, and they are often vital to that person's wellbeing and recovery. However, families, carers and supporters are often left out of engagement and not given information that would help them in their caring role. Many of those carers need, but cannot access, dedicated supports in their own right. Finally, I want to note that suicide continues to take a heavy toll on families in the Victorian community. In 2019, there were 718 deaths by suicide in Victoria. That's more than double our road toll. Suicide has a ripple effect across the community, touching loved ones, families, communities and colleagues in profound and enduring ways. While suicide is not always the result of mental illness, Suicides of people who have not been able to get help from, for their mental illness are amongst the most devastating consequences of a failing mental health system. Systems-based reform. The Commission's inquiry has shone a light on a broken system. We cannot change the past. We can, however, demand a new future and a new way forward. We must acknowledge that we, as a broader community, allowed the system's failings to go on almost unnoticed for too long. The failing of our community to demand mental health, a mental health system as strong as our physical health system says much about the stigma and discrimination against people living with mental illness and psychological distress. In considering how these challenges might be confronted, the Commission has used a systems design approach the Commission's approach was founded on seven guiding principles currently on the screen. Fundamentally, the dial must shift from a system based on eligibility to one which asks, how can we help? In the time available for this presentation, it is not possible to describe each of the 65 recommendations in the Commission's final report. I will, however, provide an overview of five key reform areas. The detail can be found in our summary and recommendations document and, of course, our full report, is, which is available on the Commission's we website, as well as fact sheets, personal stories and case studies. First, other reforms needed to build a responsive and integrated system of mental health and wellbeing services. The Commission's vision is for a balanced system in which many more services are provided in the community supported by high quality hospital and residential services for people who need them. Substantially expanded community-based mental health services will move the system away from its current crisis-driven approach to one focused on earlier intervention, better mental health outcomes and more positive consumer experiences. The Commission has deliberately chosen to name the future system the Mental Health and Wellbeing System. This recognises the importance of wellbeing supports for better mental health outcomes for individuals as well as more traditional mental health treatment. At the centre of the Commission's vision is a new system of community-based men public mental health and wellbeing services. These are shown at the bottom three rows of this diagram. The Commission has recommended 50 to 60 new local services for adults and older adults in addition to dedicated local services for infants, children and families and young people. The creation of a network of local mental health and wellbeing services recognises the importance of care delivered closer to home, closer to families and support networkers, networks and integrated with primary and secondary care including GPs. These services will provide a broader front door so that more people can access services than is currently the case. Area mental health and wellbeing services will provide tertiary level high intensity services for people with acute or complex needs. 
there will be 22 air ambulance services for adults and older adults and 13 for infants, children and young people. At the most specialised level of care are Victoria's statewide services. The Commission recommends that existing statewide services are complemented by two new statewide services focusing on the needs of people who have been affected by trauma and for people living with mental illness and substance abuse or addiction. Eight regional boards will be established to commission the local and area services to ensure that these services respond to the needs and strengths of their communities. However, the rigid catchments of current specialist mental health services, where people can only receive specialist services based on their place of residence, will be dismantled. Service providers will not turn people away on the basis of where they live. The new mental health and wellbeing system will have age-specific services that deliver developmentally appropriate treatment care and support. Whilst the strict age eligibility that can result in jarring transitions will be removed, services will be provided across two aligned systems. One is geared to infants and children from birth to 11 years old and young people 12 to 25 years old. The, system is a, the second is a system for adults aged 26 and over and older adults. The new mental health and wellbeing system will provide a greatly expanded range of service offerings. In addition to medical treatment, the system will provide extensive psychological therapies, wellbeing or psychosocial supports, mental health education, peer support and self-help options, as well as structured care planning and coordination. These recommendations highlight the broad range of ways that people can be supported to recover from mental illness and recognise that a new strength-based and integrated approach to care, treatment and support is needed. To ensure that they can deliver the full range of functions recommended by the Commission, area mental health and wellbeing services across both age-based systems will be delivered through a partnership between a public health service or a public hospital and a non-government organisation that provides wellbeing supports. People who seek help from or who are referred to a mental health and wellbeing service will have their needs assessed and will be proactively assisted to con connect with other services they may need, whether these are mental health and wellbeing services or other services and support. Crisis responses will be directly available via telephone to anyone in the community, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Where necessary, crisis outreach teams will be sent to the person. The first response to a mental health crisis should be a health response. Emergency services responses to mental health crises will be led by paramedics wherever possible with support from mental health clinicians. There will also be a range of new consumer-led safe places and residential respite services to give people more options and where they can access help in times of crisis. Bed-based services. Whilst most people will receive treatment, care and support through community-based services, hospitals and residential services will continue to play an important role in the system. The Commission's final report recommends new beds across a range of service types, including 100 new acute inpatient beds in addition to the 170 beds recommended in the interim report. While the expansion and transformation of community-based services will reduce reliance on bed-based services, People who do need these services will have access to better quality services in modern facilities. Consumers and staff will also have safer environments to recover in and work. Expansion of hospital in the home services as an alternative to hospital inpatient care will give people more choice over their treatment, care and support. Reforms will also strengthen bed-based services for young people. Every region will have a Youth Prevention and Recovery Care Unit, a YPARC, and a new youth acute inpatient stream will be established to ensure young people aged 18 to 25 are no longer admitted to adult acute inpatient beds. There will also be a new rehabilitation pathway for those needing continuing intensive care and treatment. At Tom and its Embling Hospital, 107 beds will be built as well as up to 20 additional beds for people whose needs cannot be safely and effectively met in other bed-based or community settings. Second, the Commission has made a range of recommendations to assure the system is attuned to promoting inclusion and overcoming inequities. The needs of Victoria's diverse communities will be recognised and responded to. For example, 
Victorians will be able to access appropriate mental health information regardless of first or preferred language, hearing, literacy or neurocognitive ability. Building on the reforms outlined in the Commission's interim report, supports to improve the social and emotional wellbeing of children and young people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds will be increased and healing centres delivered by Aboriginal controlled community health organisations. The Commission also acknowledges the diversity in geography, community demographics and experiences across our state. Our interim and final report found that people in rural and regional Victoria face particular challenges that affect their mental health and wellbeing and their ability to access services and supports. Building on the strengths of rural and regional communities, we have recommended a networked approach to service delivery, supporting effective collaboration and coordination between services. The Commission has also recommended allocating funding that recognise the costs of delivering high quality services in rural and regional areas. Other recommendations include trials of new digital service delivery initiatives that meet the needs of local communities and a workforce incentive scheme to attract and support mental health professionals to work in rural and regional areas. Importantly, Good mental health and wellbeing is more than about services. It is a shared priority across the community. Inequities must also be tackled where people live, work and play. There will be investment in a statewide approach to prevention and promotion activities, and these activities will concentrate on bringing a public health approach to mental health, promoting human rights and reducing imbalances in mental health and wellbeing outcomes. Community collectives will be established to bring together community leaders and members to promote social connection and inclusion in every local government area. Anti-stigma programs will be implemented and there will be better access to legal protection for mental health discrimination. Our emphasis on equity and justice includes overturning the power imbalances between consumers and those who design and deliver services. In a first for Victoria, our recommendations will establish lived experience leaders throughout the system and set up initiatives led by people with lived experience. A new agency will be established led by people with lived experience of mental illness or psychological distress to support consumer-led organisations and services. Enhanced service delivery approaches and new legislation will give consumers more choice and control over their treatment, care and support. More lived experience professionals and experts will be employed in a variety of roles. The system will also work with people in their social context from the start. This is a fundamental shift. The role families, carers and supporters can play as part of the care team will be recognised. Information sharing will be improved to support this. Families, carers and supporters will also be supported in their own right including through the establishment of eight new family and carer-led centres across the state. The abandonment of young people in particular by multiple service systems has been shameful. For some young people, meeting other young carers at a commission consultation was the first time they had made a connection and felt supported. The commission recommends dedicated support for workers and a significant increase in funding to help young carers with practical needs. Third, the Commission has made several recommendations that focus on getting the system's foundations right. As Associate Professor Safarchi observed, the current system is achieving what it was set up to achieve. These conditions must change. The Commission's recommendations will create new structures and approaches to systems leadership, funding, commissioning, planning and governance. A new independent and statutory mental health and wellbeing commission will be established to hold the Victorian Government to account for the performance of the mental health and wellbeing system and the implementation of the Commission's recommendations. A new Chief Officer for Mental Health and Wellbeing will be established in the Department of Health. This will be a statutory appointment to elevate mental health and wellbeing as a government priority and to ensure it is never again buried within government. We believe a new state strategy is necessary to establish a contemporary approach to suicide prevention and response that takes into account the latest evidence, including a systems-based and whole-of-government approach. Noting the suite of initiatives we've already recommended, we believe this strategy can be swiftly developed. 
This approach involves many agencies coming together across health, social sciences, education, industry, and many more to respond to the interrelated factors of suicide. As such, we have recommended a Suicide Prevention and Response Office to lead this work. Our set of initiatives are aimed at the population level, at those who may be experiencing suicidal behaviour and those who are at risk of suicidal behaviour. This work builds on the recommendations about suicide prevention and response in our interim report. There will also be new mechanisms to ensure that the quality and safety of mental health and wellbeing services are of the highest standard. A new mental health improvement unit within Safer Care Victoria will focus on reducing the use of seclusion, restraint and compulsory treatment and tackling gender-based violence, particularly in inpatient settings. The aim is to greatly reduce the use of seclusion and restraint, eventually eliminating these practices and to substantially reduce the use of compulsory treatment so that it is only used as a last resort and for the shortest period possible. Investment in mental health and wellbeing will be made a priority through the implementation of the levy recommended in the interim report. However, the approach to planning, funding and commissioning services will also be overhauled and modernised to ensure that the government and community gets the best value for its money and that services reflect the needs of the community. The Commission's reimagined mental health and wellbeing system will be enshrined in legislation through a new Mental Health and Wellbeing Act. The new Act will reflect the vision for the future system and will promote good mental health and wellbeing as well as better supporting the rights and empowerment of mental health consumers. There will be a renewed focus on rigorous measurement of progress in the achievement of outcomes for consumers, families, carers and supporters. Fourth, the Commission has called for a fundamental modernisation of the system. This will include up-to-date information technology and digital approaches to service delivery. For example, as the COVID pandemic has shown us, there are opportunities to deliver some services more efficiently using online and telehealth technologies. Whilst these will never altogether replace face-to-face -face mental health services, they can extend the reach of services to more people and provide people with more choice about how they want to be helped. We have also recommended structures to support service innovation and the embedding of evidence-based forms of treatment, care and support into service delivery. There will be strong focus on developing, testing and embedding new approaches together with people who have lived experience of mental illness or psychological distress, families, carers and supporters. Fifth, the Commission's recommendations will support a sustainable workforce for the future. Our recommendations include steps to grow and diversify the workforce, including lived experience workforces and a shift to more multidisciplinary work and new ways of working across services. Recommendations include new incentives and support for mental health professionals to train, live and work in rural and regional communities. The Commission also recognises a dedicated focus on workforce strategy, capability and wellbeing informed by ongoing data collection, analysis, planning and collaboration is needed. The new responsive and integrated mental health and wellbeing system must also ensure that the workforce feels safe and respected regardless of professional discipline, role or workplace setting. The next steps. The implementation of the Commission's recommendations will not be easy. The system is complex and so too are the causes of poor mental health. The Commission's recommendations however, are, however, pragmatic and achievable. They have been informed by two years of analysis and significant input from people with lived experience, families, carers and supporters and the workforce. Implementation should not be delayed by repeating consultations we have already done. The Commission has set out its analysis of what will be required for implementation in the final volume of our report. We know what is needed and we know what must be avoided. The transformation recommended by the Commission will not come cheaply, but the cost of inaction are too great. Achieving the Commission's vision will require more than money. Equally importantly is the shared commitment, the ambition and collective effort it's respectful of each other's perspectives that are required across government, service providers, community groups, advocates, people with lived experience of mental illness or psychological distress, families, carers and supporters. 
This Commission's work is not the first inquiry into the mental health system. However, there is much call for hope that this time there will be real and enduring change. The Commission has observed a strong commitment to following through. The Victorian Government has committed to implementing all of the Commission's recommendations. In its most recent state budget, it allocated substantial initial funding for the reforms recommended in the Commission's interim report. The Deputy Premier is now Minister for Mental Health. The Commonwealth Government has also shown a commitment to improving the mental health and wellbeing of the community. This has been apparent through the Productivity Commission's inquiry into mental health and the work of the Prime Minister's National Suicide Prevention Advisor to develop a government-wide approach to suicide prevention and response. Alongside this interest from government, there is also an encouraging level of public discourse and open communication about good mental health and wellbeing. This has been particularly evident during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has had broad social and economic impacts for Victorians. All of these circumstances combine to provide a real chance for us all to work together with a united voice to shift the centre of gravity away from crisis and NDs and into the community. In conclusion, the final report of the Commission is a truly collective effort. We are deeply grateful to the people who engage with the Commission to share their experience, knowledge and ideas for a new and better system. We have been humbled by the extraordinary commitment, dedication and care people have shown, particularly during such challenging conditions for our community. The voices of people living with mental illness or psychological distress, families, carers and supporters were central to our work. They have shared often painful personal experiences in the hope that others will benefit from a better mental health system in the future. I may extend my thanks to those that were willing to share their experiences so generously with the media to extend the public discourse about mental health. We are also deeply indebted to the many mental health workers, organisations and academics for their generous and thoughtful contributions. I would also like to thank those who, were, who organised the Commission's work and helped us analyse the inputs and write the report. The talented and hard-working Commission staff, led by our skillful and dedicated CEO, Jody Geisler. The Commission has also been ably assisted by its expert advisory committee, led by Professor Pat McGorry, specialist advisors to the Commission, including lived experience advisors, as well as senior and junior counsel assisting. I also acknowledge the people that will take the implementation effort forward. It will involve many, many people. I acknowledge the work to date of Pam Anders and Professor Simon Safachi, who have been leading the implementation of the Commission's interim report recommendations, and also Kim Peake, former Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, for her leadership and commitment to mental health reform over the years all the public officials who so generously gave their time to the Commission, including Terry Simmons and Ross Broad, the Commission is grateful for your support. I also note the role that Ewan Wallace and Catherine Wetton will hold in, as being responsible for system stewardship going forward. However, this is not something that government can carry alone. Implementation will belong to everyone working within the system and also the community. As the other commissioners and I conclude our work, we are aware of our great privilege in having a once in a generation opportunity to review and comprehensively redesign Victoria's mental health system. We know that the public has placed great trust in this commission and we have felt the gravity of this responsibility keenly. We have been moved by the sense of hope and shared purpose we have witnessed over the last two years. This hope is reflected in the reforms outlined in our interim and final reports. We want Victoria's generations of the future to be confident and resilient. The importance of good mental health and wellbeing cannot be sidelined any longer. It matters too much to too many. This is not someone else's problem. This is about all of us. It is time for a collective call to action on the back of this final report to create a better future for people with mental illness and psychological distress and to realise the hopes of so many Victorians. 
The Victorian community's optimism and desire for change provides an opportunity to create reform that will last. All partners in delivering this reform must ride to, rise to the challenge. The Commission's inquiry is over. It is now time to act.